Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this Niagara County Genealogical Society's program. Our, well, I'll start with myself then. My name is Jeanette Chaliga and I am the programming chair and current chairman of the board for Niagara County. And our program tonight is free resources for Canadian family history research by the wonderful Steve Fulton. So thank you much, so much, Steve, for being here tonight with us um, and sharing all of your Canadian knowledge, which I, from all of our years of knowing each other, you just blow me away every time that we get together because you are just so on top of all of um, everything there needs to do in Canadian research. So I am going to pass it on to you and say, take it away. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jeanette. And, and welcome, everybody. And thanks for having me tonight. And wow, uh, how am I going to cover all of this? And in 45 minutes or 50 minutes, whatever the time frame is. Uh, we talked so long ago about it. So I'm just gonna keep talking until probably Jeanette shuts the lights out on me. But, you mean like, uh, a, like a big hook, a Zoom hook yeah. to pull you off the stage? Probably. <laughs> no, probably. 50 minutes would be good, good. thank you. <laughs> Problem. So tonight we're just gonna, it's going to be a very, a very broad kind of conversation about different resources, because we all have a tendency of going to, you know, the big box stores in concern to genealogy, not to mention any of them. They're all wonderful. They all have a place in genealogy. They all do a fantastic, fantastic job, but they do get this information from archives, from libraries, and that's where this information comes from originally. And as well, uh, we have genealogical societies and local branches and museums. This comes from as well. So we're just going to get started here. I'm just hearing a little bit of background, but I think it's gone now. Thank you. Yes, I, I got it. Thanks. So I just want to talk a little bit about the basics. The basics about Canadian research. Um, and I'll, I'll just put it right out there. We did not become a country till 1867. So compared to the United States, we're like the teenager of North America. Uh, we're not as old as the United States. We don't go back. My wife has a, a US connection that goes back to the 1600s, I believe it is. So, uh, and those records are available and uh, can be accessed. In concern to Canadian research, uh, I'm just gonna actually go to a map because maps to me are very important in our research. In 1867, this was Canada. That's it, that little purple or pink and you know, just a little bit of color. The rest of that was all the Hudson Bay Company. And yes, it is a, a store uh, that is still in existence today. It is the oldest store in Canada, uh, but they actually owned all of this territory uh, in, uh, in Canada at that time. So when you're looking for Canada, like I've had questions before when I went down to Roots Tech and stuff like that. And people would ask, they'd say, well, I'm looking for a birth certificate from 1783 in Saskatchewan. Well, Saskatchewan didn't exist at that time frame. And the other thing that's important to know about Canada is that we had multiple names in the process. So there was Upper Canada, Lower Canada, Canada East, Canada West, uh, just Canada itself, uh, the province of Canada, um, and, and so forth. And then uh, uh, New France, originally from the beginning. So with all of that, um, I really, really encourage you, if you are doing research, make sure you know the territory, know your geography to do your genealogy because you could be spinning wheels uh, looking for something that just simply doesn't exist. 
finally, the last thing that I'm just going to share with you, compared to the US, Canada's privacy laws are very stringent. Uh, they have very clearly defined times when information can be released. We see lots of questions from the US people looking for birth information from 1950 uh, or 1960. And it just simply doesn't, it's not available. It's just public, it's not public domain information. So um, uh, 1917 is the latest actually for birth. And uh, we'll get into that in just a few minutes here. So originally we, we wanted to talk about the uh, Library and Archives Canada. And when Jeanette and I were speaking about this, we talked about, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about the archives and then let's add some additional things in there, uh, like, um, you know, the, uh, not only the federal, but the provincial and then the local, and just kind of give you an overall taste of what is available uh, for you to do some research in. So, I'm just going to switch my screen because we're going to go from the PowerPoint to a live website um, because there's no point of copying when it's all right there. So just give me a moment. I'm going to stop the share there. I'm going to uh, share this. And you should see the Library and Archives Canada's webpage. Jeanette, can you? Yep, it looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So welcome to Library and Archives Canada. Um, a lot of the information that you can find on Ancestry or MyHeritage or FamilySearch will come from the archives. Uh, the difference is one is a government website. One is a corporate website, and the corporate website is much, much more intuitive and much better organized. Uh, Library and Archives Canada is a, a national, is our federal archive for all things to do with Canada as a country. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you a few of the databases, but with that, it, it's you have to be patient with using the website. Uh, use the search up here in the top right hand and continue to look um, for information of that. As well, down below, you'll find services and information such as census, military yeah, heritage, Fox News. and family history here. So, we're just going to go to the family history. And when we click on the family history right here, we'll end up on this particular tab. And this is just really a welcome page that the government has built. It's kind of their summary, uh, what to do first for those who are just getting new into Canadian research. Uh, they've even got a couple family tree charts if you want to download them. But what you're really looking for is these databases. And you can click on Ancestor Search and land on this particular tab. So the difference between federal and provincial in management of information uh, sometimes can be a little bit of a challenge. For example, Birth, marriages, and deaths, or BMDs, are managed by the province. But the acts of divorce are actually managed by the federal government. Uh, because divorce, back in the day, uh, you had to uh, have an act of parliament in order to become divorced. Well, now Justice Canada manages all the court records in concern to divorce. So there you will see, and I'll explain as we go, uh, I'm just gonna to touch base on a few of these. Census. Now census um, is kind of all over the map. 
the earliest census you can get is actually um, from the mid 1600s. And um, that is from New France at the time. But most of them uh, started 1825, Lower Canada, Canada East, Canada West, and they go every 10 years and they work their way up to the latest census of Canada, which is 1921. Censuses become public domain after approximately 94, it floats, 94, 95 years. The thing about Canada though is each province joined, except for the four original, as I showed you on the map, each province joined at a different time. They joined confederation at a different time. And Newfoundland and Labrador did not join confederation until 1949. So their census, there is a 1945 census available for anyone searching in Newfoundland or Labrador. So as you go through this, you can find it. Of course, uh, the censuses are well done within the bigger organizations, but you can find information here about census. Immigration and citizenship, of course, that's a federal passenger list um, and the different things that go on here. One of the most common ones that I wanted to share was the home children. And not too many people are familiar with the home children. And actually yesterday was what we call British Home Children Day in Canada, where we recognize uh, children. And my wife's grandfather was a home child. He came over when he was seven years of age because his family could no longer care for him, him and his brother. His father had passed away. The mother had like 10 kids. Uh, an organization came in. And there's hundreds of thousands of kids that came to Canada and other Commonwealth countries. And all of a sudden, we always say this, all of a sudden, if you have a kid that just you know, just pops all of a sudden, it's just there on a census and may have a different last name or that child could be a British home child. And if they are, this is where you're going to find that information about them. Um, so passenger lists are very few and far between uh, before 1850. There is a few sites dedicated to passenger lists I don't have them listed here today, but if you Google them, uh, you will be able to find them uh, to that. Land, land records. Land records are all over the place in Canada, in the provinces, in the municipalities. Uh, they are a little bit of a disaster. And uh, of course, they're working on getting that resolved. Military. Uh, Black Loyalists, Refugees, the Book of Negroes, service records for World War I and World War II, and war diaries of the First World War. So all the documents for World War I are now available and they are online and you can get them on this particular website. World War II records are not available online and only a direct descendant can write to the Library and Archives Canada to get the file for their ancestor. I did it for my grandfather and I got his service records. It was really cool. I'll be very honest. It was very cool to get it. But the most, the, the, the greatest thing I got was a line and it was his signature literally just him writing his name out and uh it was so unique to see that and and to get that information other things like the post office uh railway employees uh the northwest mounted police 
uh, personnel records from 1873 to 1904. So they are a government organization that has a budget and has uh, done a lot of work, but there's still so, so much more uh, that they just have not digitized and it is not available uh, on their website. Um, organizations uh, like the Niagara Peninsula Branch or Ontario Ancestors have partnered with them and we will talk about that as we go along uh, in this conversation. So um, we're just going to take a step down from federal to provincial and we'll kind of go over this because there's something really important that I think you should be aware of in that. So welcome to the Archives of Ontario. Uh, it is in North Toronto at York University. And they again are uh, another government organization that is the archives for the province of Ontario. And I'll be honest, they do, uh, their website is not very intuitive. Um, they have some challenges. Uh, I have expressed my concern with them. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to go to the archives of Ontario, uh, be prepared uh, when you come. There is a section on this website dedicated to uh, going to the archives, what information, because it is actually very overwhelming. Uh, they have a ton of information and it's not online. And that makes it a bit of a struggle. But one of the things they do have online that I would share with you is these research guides. And I just remembered that I was going to put some of this into the chat. So um, I will start to do that. Um, these research guides are probably one of the most important things that you can find uh, in the archives. So for example, when we click on the birth, marriage and death, or what it, which one did I have? Filing, uh, finding bankruptcy records. These research guides are a start to finish when they started to record this information, how it changed and where it is today. So like bankruptcy records pre-1920, okay? This is to deal with any records before that time. And then from 1920 to 1976, and then 1977 to 1990, and then gives a lot of information and uh, notes and stuff of information that you want. So say if we click on birth, marriage and death records, um, we can click on these and we've got vital stats, understanding the stats and there we go, right here. So birth registrations, when did the birth occur? Before, Confeder uh, you know, just uh, before 1869, between these dates, after these dates. This is where the privacy really starts to kick in. And this is where information through its regular course is available or not available. So before 1869, Remember Confederation was 1867. The government gave everybody two years and then they were starting to register. Well, I'll be really honest with you. Not a lot of people did it. Not a lot of kids got registered or if they got registered, they all did them in a batch. They, you know, they went in with five or six kids. They registered them all. You know, they got things to do. They're on a farm. They got lives to live. Why, why register these kids? Um, and it is still very common today. I had a great uncle who applied for his old age pension. 
and had to file a late registration for his birth because the government in their ultimate wisdom didn't know that he was born. Uh, so, but they managed to take his taxes. So that was always the running joke. But so when you're dealing with uh, uh, ancestors uh, during this time period, even up into uh, to 1920, you may not find a birth notice uh, simply because they just never registered the child. Uh, and it just wasn't done. One suggestion I would always give to you is that during this time, yeah, the government ran the country, but the church was involved. And if you uh, were not involved in the church in that time period, uh, that was not a good thing. So if you cannot find it in a birth or a marriage or a death, during this time period, uh, start to look in the community uh, where you're researching, figure out the churches, maybe the church is still around, the records are around, maybe the records are in an archive uh, somewhere. Uh, that is one way around this bit of information. When it comes to, and we're just going to uh, just stop there just for a second to talk about the different government records and stuff um, about privacy um, and that. So births now are not available. Um, it's 115 years now. So normally births were 100 years and then they would release that information to um, public domain. Well, a lot of people we knew, uh, I knew a lady well, and she was 101, I believe, and we were pulling her birth certificate off of Ancestry. So the government stepped in and said, no, this isn't acceptable, and they raised that age. Uh, death, it's everything uh, before 1938. And marriages, I think it's 1946, I believe. So anything before those dates, you can uh, find them in public domain. Anything after those dates, you have to go to the a government organization called Service Ontario. And you have to be a direct descendant in order to get that information. So um, there are ways of getting around that. Of course, local newspapers, local libraries have most of their local newspapers, um, or there could be um, city directories that you can access or census records uh, as well. But of course, census stopping at 1921, you'd be out of luck in 1930 for that. So these research guides are very important, not only to uh, understand where the records are, but to have uh, an understanding of the process. Um, one person asked me once about divorce records and uh, how could they find uh, divorce records or to find a particular divorce record they were looking for. And I just encourage them to go back and research divorce in Ontario, in Canada at that time. I aimed them right at this guide and they were able to acquire that information uh, that they were looking for. So if, if this is the most important thing out of the uh, Ontario archives, this would be it right here. So moving along, we'll get into uh, Ontario Ancestors, which I'm uh, uh, part of. And this is Canada's largest genealogical society. It is uh, each province in Canada has a at least one genealogical society in it. We do not have a federal uh, genealogical society. 
uh, all the provinces seem to be just fine uh, not having one. Uh, it's, it's something we're working on, but as it stands, this is where we are. But some of the resources that you can find on here uh, for Ontario ancestors is the uh, uh, webinars we have on a monthly basis. We have a master library catalog, but most of all, um, there are is in development and is constantly in development, a society and branches index, which I think is probably uh, the second most important thing. The most important is actually Tony or the Ontario name index, which has over 12 million records and it is a referral database. So it doesn't mean we have the record. It just means it's going to point you in the right direction to get it. The Society and Branch Indexes, the Society has over 35 branches and special interest groups across the province. And they're all made up of different counties. Um, I'm in the Niagara uh, region, so that would be the Lincoln and Welland County. And here you will find wherever you're researching. Now we're not in every county, but we're in pretty much uh, the most of them. And if you were looking in, uh, say Niagara, for example, you click on the, the plus sign on the right-hand side, and it gives you the resources that are available on that particular website. Some of them are public accessible, and some of them are in the members only area. Uh, we'll show another one here, here on Branch. Uh, that's up near Godridge. And they also have a master index, a Atlas index, and other particular information as well. Um, and some of you may be very interested in um, Haldeman. And they have a cemetery index and sheriff's papers from 1848 to 1933. So if you have family, you know, that black sheep of the family, you might be able to find them there in the sheriff's papers. So that's quite exciting as well. So this resource is um, very important in what they do. And finally, the society site uh, they have indexes as well. Uh, the Families Index or the Huguenot Collection or the Independent Order of Odd Fellows insurance papers. Uh, during a period of time, the IOOF was selling medical insurance. And you can find information, very detailed information about possibly your ancestor in there uh, during that time. Uh, Tony, we talked about land petitions, and finally the Vernon City Directories. And I'm I'm hoping you're all familiar with the city directories. Um, you can um, what we did a couple years back before COVID started. Uh, the Archi Library and Archives Canada, or LAC, which I like to call Family Search and Ontario Ancestors, all came together. It was a remarkable thing. And we started to digitize all the Vernon City directories across the province of Ontario. And that's no small feat by any standards. We estimate when the project is done to have close to a quarter of a billion names in the Vernon City directories that people will be able to click on. So I just put the link into the chat. Uh, if you wanna go check that out, the images right now are stored on Family Search's book section of their website. All you have to do is sign in and you can browse them. Unfortunately, COVID come along and the project came to a stop. So we're hoping to get that back up and running uh, sooner than later. So uh, let's see here, the uh, branches, 
branch and special interest groups, you will find uh, a map on the right hand side that if you click on, it will actually, it's actually a clickable map. So here's Niagara and Haldeman, Norfolk, Oxford. And if you click on them, they'll actually take you to that particular branch. Uh, we have branches in Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Nipissing, Ottawa. Uh, there's only a few, I think it's Muskoka and Halliburton uh, that we don't cover. Um, but hey, we're willing to do that. But in this, if we go back, you will find a link to all of the branches and all of the special interest groups uh, within the society. And special interest groups are the British Home Children, the Ireland Special Interest Group, the Irish Palestine Special Interest Group, the Scottish Special Interest Group, and the Eastern European Special Interest Group as well. So that's what you will find uh, there. So we're just going to take one more step down and we're going to just land on the Niagara branch. Since we're next door neighbors, I figured I'd, uh, you know, head in this general direction. And this, we have a lot of connections back and forth. Um, Jeanette is still waiting for a box of books uh, that got delayed from going back over to uh, your organization. Um, and in that box of books, um, there was a, a uh, marriage records for the Niagara Falls, New York side of the suspension bridge where marriages were taking place. Well, on our side, we have the Canadian version of that suspension bridge marriages. And I'm hoping sooner than later, we can combine these books and make it a joint, uh, joint publication. So a lot of our ancestors flowed back and forth uh, across a border or not even a border at the time. There was no border at the time. One of the uh, things that we have created on the website and it is free for you to search is the Lincoln and Welling County Master Index. And in the Master Index, which I'll just copy and put into the chat, um, you will just, you can just do a search on uh, anything in the, in any of the publications. There's dozens of publications that you will find in this master index. And you can uh, get um, that. So with that, it will give you the name, the publication, and you can actually click on view details, which then it will load up another page and will give you further information about the uh, particular record as you can see uh, below. This particular one, uh, this John Fulton uh, is in the St. Andrews Presbyterian Church and it's under a society, uh, under our society marketplace. There are a few other indexes. We, we had quite a few originally and we then uh, brought them all together under one, except these last few that um, actually just we can't get it to fit in. Um, this uh, Lincoln marriage certificates, um, there are some records, original marriage certificates from the Beamsville area uh, that you can search as well. So, to throw something back to your side, um, I wanted to bring one website uh, to you. And, I, and I'm confident many of you use FultonHistory.com. 
And one of the things that we have learned uh, on this side of the border is that your American news does a much better job at reporting uh, our news than we do reporting our news. So just very quickly, I was able to uh, bring up a marriage notice in a paper. And um, you can see right here that it, it's talking about uh, St. Catharines or Quebec um, and Canadian information. And there is lots of information uh, that you can find on FultonHistory.com. So um, as I started to talk about it in the beginning, there is a mountain of information that you can find in concern to uh, genealogical uh, information. Um, the one thing we have not touched base on is land records. And land records in the province of Ontario are currently being dealt with because they've actually just closed in the last eight months, they've just closed all the land registry offices in Ontario to the public. And if you go to, um, if we do a quick Google search on Onland, you will actually find a website that you need to go to now in order to, um, to find any sort of uh, land records. It is a process. Uh, it is not something that it'll take a couple, you know, a few minutes for you to figure out. Uh, you're going to have to get an understanding of Ontario land records. Not all of them are digitized. The government has got an organization working on that. Um, but it, it, it is a challenge. In the Niagara region alone, there is seven different locations for land records. Uh, it's spread across the region and it can be very difficult uh, to deal with. One of the uh, things that I will probably be posting onto our social, social media uh, in a bit here is we have a volunteer that is working on uh, learning videos. And one of the learning videos she just created was about land records, about known lot and concession. And it's about 45 minutes long, but it is well worth the time uh, to, to listen to that, to understand how she finds lot and concession and how it ties to the on-land website in order to find the records you're looking for. Um, many of the other provinces, uh, just touch base if you have ancestors in other provinces, they all have uh, family history uh, websites. They all have archives. Um, Quebec, uh, they have one main English speaking genealogical society and then three other French speaking genealogical societies. They are the uh, biggest province to, uh, to have so many genealogical societies. Um, I do know that there are a few organizations on your side of the border uh, that can get that information. Uh, or, or that has a Canadian connection as well to that. So with that, it, I apologize. It's, it's a very broad brush that I've, I've spoken on. But if there's anything for you to take away uh, tonight is simply understand the geography uh, in order to understand your genealogy in Canada. Don't give up, find social media pages if you're on Facebook and 
or you can just email a branch. We would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love to entertain your questions and see what kind of information we can provide you in your research. So with that, I would entertain any questions or um, anything along that line. Thank you so much, Steve. Holy cow, that's a lot of information that I know. you I'm just sorry. shared. I'm sorry. No, that's what we need, right, everyone? <laughs> um, so you can feel free to um, write a question into the chat area, or if you would like to ask Steve yourself, you can um, unmute and turn on your camera. I'm not seeing any questions yet, but I know I sometimes need some extra time. Um, now you mentioned right at the end, you know, kind of going back to the beginning about becoming aware of the the history of the geography. Do you yes. um, go to Family Searches Wiki to kind of look at stuff like that? Actually, what I'm going to do is, if you give me just a moment. I am going to share a map with you in the chat window. I'll just send you mm -hmm. a, a PDF of the clickable map. And on the back has all the re resources. But it's going to take me just a minute to uh, pull that up. OK, I we'll just... wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me just get there. Let me just get there. So, but there is no questions. No, I have one. Okay. Oh. Uh, it's Rita. I'm just curious, what's the UE stand for after your name? <laughs> the UE actually is specifies unity of empire. So my direct descendant was a United okay. Empire loyalist. They fled during the Revolutionary War. It is the opposite of the DARS or the DAR, sorry, Jeanette or the SARs, um, but it is really the only Canadian, uh, if you have to have a descendant who swore to king and country and got 200 free acres in order to bear that initial. So not wow. a descendant, but an ancestor, a direct ancestor, you mean? Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and you said it at first. And I'm like, did he mean that? And then when you said it no, a second time, I'm like, nope. <laughs> okay. I've, I've seen other Canadians have the UE um, after their name as well. It, it serves two purposes. One, actually, it serves three purposes. One, it kind of solidifies my research. Like it gives that kind of gold seal to the to my research. Two, it honors my uh, ancestors. And three, you'd be surprised how many conversations I've gotten in because people like yourself, Rita, have asked me what UE stands for. Okay. So learn something new. <laughs> and hey, hey, that's what it's all about tonight, I think. Exactly. So I've Thank just you. dropped, you're most welcome. So I'm just putting these files, I'm doing an Ontario and a Canada map for you in the chat window. It's a two page, one first page is the, uh, the breakdown of the counties for Ontario. And then the second one uh, for Canada is the breakdown of the provinces and territories. But if you go to the second page on both files, it has a bucket load. It, it's, it's uh, you can forget about sleeping for the next couple of days because it'll keep you busy. Peter, uh, Shelly, Shelly Richards here from Lockport, New York. Yes. Do you have any, can you tell us anything about the Peterson? Settlement in uh, uh, Peter, oh, Robinson Settlement in Upper Canada. So the Robertson Settlement in Upper Canada 
do we have a um, a general, a, a little bit more general area than Upper Canada? Because Upper Canada is Peter Peterborough, Peterborough. Okay, so that's going to be up in the, that's going to be up in the Kawartha counties. Yeah. It was uh, the it was the, the the these people came from um, Ireland and were settled into into the uh, into the ca Canadian Upper North there in that area, Peterborough. Oh gosh, uh, early eighteen hundreds. Um, what do you know about that? What what can you tell us about that? And maybe unfortunately, you can't. unfortunately that's a little bit out of my territory. Um, but I have put in the chat window the website for the Kawartha branch that covers that area. And there is a wonderful lady by the name of Alvina who would be more than willing to uh, lend a hand and help you figure, uh, you know, fill in any blanks that you may. Okay, thank you. You're more than welcome. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Dave's just smiling. No. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm sure if you have any questions, you know, you can reach out to Steve and, um, you know, mention that you were at tonight's program. If you um, would like to save all of the web addresses that he put into, into the chat, um, you'll want to click on those three dots and, and then it will say save chat. And so you can save the chat that way. I am going to leave this open to give everyone enough time to do that, but I am going to say a final thank you to Steve and stop our recording. And we will be posting this to YouTube. I can probably get it up tonight. So let me stop recording. <laughs>